Thank you everyone for joining us today for the 2023 Loke Lecture in Jewish History. My name is Natan Meir. I am the Lori Loke Professor of Judaic Studies at Portland State University in the Harold Schnitzer Family Program in Judaic Studies. Um, and as you can probably tell, uh, Professor Zipperstein and I have decided to structure the program today as a conversation rather than as a frontal lecture, which I think will probably suit many of you, if not all of you. Well, you'll let me know afterwards, I suppose. Um, this, this is an audience who tends to complain. Yeah, this is a complaining audience for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's good to know these things at the outset. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just modulate. No, we we love our our our, our Portland our G Portland State Judaic Studies audience tends to be a very very kind one, and I'm really appreciative that you're all here today. Uh, I'm going to uh, first of all introduce our guest. Stephen J. Zipperstein is Daniel E. Koshlin Professor of Jewish Culture and History at Stanford University, and is the author and editor of nine books. The most recent, Pogrom, Kishinev, and the Tilt of History, was named a Book of the Year by The Economist, Haaretz, and Mosaic Magazine, and shortlisted as the best nonfiction book of the year by the Mark Litton Prize. He has taught at universities in Russia, France, and Israel, and for six years at Oxford University. He's an editor of Yale's Jewish Lives, a biography series, which I highly recommend, which has to date published nearly 70 books and is currently writing a biography of Philip Roth. I'm also happy to let you know that Professor Zipperstein was recently elected, very recently, the last few weeks, to the American Academy for Arts and Sciences. I am doubly honored and pleased that Professor Zipperstein is with us today because He's also been a mentor and a friend to me. I remember well when he flew to Portland in 2011 to give a talk at the celebration here at PSTU honoring the publication of my first book on the Jews of Tsarist Kiev. And um, I'm grateful for the wise counsel you've offered to me over the years, including the last couple hours or so. So it's... <laughs> Indeed. I also want to note on a sadder note that this is the first Lori I. Loke lecture since Lori's passing last October. Lori was a stalwart friend of our program and played a significant role in its growth. In addition to establishing a chair in Jewish history, which I have the privilege of holding, he also created a scholarship that enables our students to study in Israel and a generous library fund. He was not only a generous supporter of higher education, both in the US and Israel. He was also a mensch, a really good guy, and a fun guy to spend time with. And I should also note that he had a long standing association with Stanford, despite his Portland roots, um, where today's guest has taught for. I know his, his ex wife, but she never touched anything. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. Oh, they're asking you to use the mic, Steve. I, I, do. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've often found that when I speak, especially to Jewish audiences, you're told no one could hear you before you begin to speak. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, but, but I, can you hear me now? Uh, you can't, because because I because I turned the mic off. Um, uh, it's all it's all David's fault. And um, it, it, uh, uh, <laughs> David, could, could you stop um, persecuting this audience and turn the mic on? Thank you. Is it on? I have no idea. Or is it about bringing it closer to your... Is, is it now on? Yeah, okay. it's about having okay. it over here. Good. It, it's, it's good to meet all of you. Um, so, I, so yes, along the lines of, of, uh, of Lori, I just wanted to, uh, to close that particular paragraph by, um, by wishing, expressing the, the hope that his memory will be for a blessing, as I'm sure we, it will be. Um, and lastly, I wanted to uh, thank Congregation Beit Chavirim, 
um, and Rabbi Allenberg, who's here with us today, um, um, for bringing our guest in to Portland and for co-sponsoring uh, this event with us. So thank you so much, Rabbi Berg. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I should probably say, since I'm the chair of the Judaic Studies program, that we have material about our program at the back, uh, which you're welcome to take after the program is over. And as many of you here already know, we have uh, courses that are open to senior auditors over 65. Um, and if you are under the age of 65 and still want to audit one of our courses, speak to me because we can sometimes arrange for that to happen. So. Steve, I'd like to start by asking how you came to write this book. And for all, for those of you who have who haven't read it yet, you need to read it. It is a study in historical writing. It's lucid. It's eloquent. It's controlled, and it really draws the reader into its, I would say, meditative and introspective mood. Now we know. I know something about how you came to write the book, because in the acknowledgments, you note that the project began as a cultural history of Russian Jews, but you became so intrigued by the long afterlife of the Kishinev pogrom that you chose to focus on that particular thread. But I wonder if you could expand a bit on, on that journey. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a great admirer of Natanz. You're very lucky to have him here. Um, so I, um, yeah, I, I did not intend to, to write this, this book. I, I, um, I started, I signed a contract with a trade publisher to write a history of actually all of East European and Russian Jewry from the late 18th century to the present. And um, as I've done with my other books, I, um, I subdivide books into sort of, in a sense, chewable parts. Um, and I can devote myself thoroughly, say, for five weeks to one section. And I've learned to move ahead in my work by then, if I, if I continue to work on that section beyond the five weeks, I then impose um, insomnia onto myself. And uh, it's, it's an erotic process. I don't advise it for anyone, but it's worked for me, and I've been able to move forward in writing books in this way. And so the focus on Kishinev was to be just one, just one of these sections. And then I started digging into it and realized that um, if I could explain the the interplay between all of the the, the events I described, the Kishna pogrom of 1903, April 1903, is as it happens the best documented event in the Russian Jewish past. We have huge body of documentation in Russian, Yiddish, um, Hebrew, other languages, German, um, that that detail the looting of almost every single house and shop. In, in, and, and it's an event that actually gives the word pogrom its salience for the first time. It's often translated beforehand into various Western languages, no longer after the Kishna pogrom. And what I started to learn was that it had a um, indelible impact, left an indelible impact on um, the relatively unrestricted freedom of Jew Jewish immigration to the United States this one year after the Atsi alien, after the um, restriction of Chinese, um, Chinese immigration to the United States in 1902. It had actually an impact on the way in which lynching ended up being described as its immediate precursor to the creation of what comes to be the NAACP. It's um, the immediate precursor for the to the first appearance of the protocols of the elders of Zion. It's the inspiration for the what comes to be the Israeli army and almost every single thing that is known about it is incorrect. And, um, and so I, I, I realized, I, I was just asked recently when I was elected to the American Academy to write a letter. Apparently this, 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 this uh, request goes back to the first members of it, including Alexander Hamilton. I've never looked at his letter. And, um, and so I, I tried to, I was thinking about what connected my various books, what connects my pogrom, this pogrom book with the book on Philip Roth, for example. And what I started to, to realize was that the, the connective tissue that, that links my various books is a desire to understand how, um, how the interplay between what people believe to be true 
and what actually history demonstrates to be accurate. I grew up in an um, Orthodox Jewish home, moved away from, from it um, in my late teens, early 20s. But to some extent, I've always been fascinated by the interplay between counterintuitive belief and, um, and demonstrative fact. And I think that's what made me an historian. As I discussed a couple of nights ago in Beit Chavirim, um, this could have made me an utterly obsessive human being because just, just to, 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 to fixate on something that actually inspired you from the age of 18 or 19, usually, usually that affects people who you want to cross the street from when you actually see them walking towards you. Um, I, I, for, fortuitously, I was able to, to make this work for me. As an historian, it's those sorts of questions that have preoccupied me. And here was the mother load of all stories. And, um, and um, almost everything that Jews and also anti-Semites and others came to believe about Jews, about the past, actually was contained in this one episode. And almost everything about it um, that's remembered is wrong and um, historically wrong. And um, I wrote this book before the um, ubiquitous use of the term fake news, but it's a book about fake news. It, it's, a, it's a book about what it is that we come to believe, people come to believe that um, actually has, has no basis in reality. And yet the unreality actually becomes so potently important and, and pervasive that that actually, it, it's, it's really a study of the phenomenon that we were, that was captured in that um, in that famous quote of, of a former president: "Don't believe what you see; believe what I say." And um, and um, so the book emerged before um, he counterintuitively emerged into all of our lives. But in some ways, it actually speaks to something of the same phenomenon, and that's that's how it it came about. I mean, everything that I've I've tried to write. And that I urge my graduate students to write really is a is a melding the product byproduct of a melding of, of mind and heart. If you don't care about what you're doing, it just doesn't work. It shows it, it, it like like a fish it sinks from the head. And um, you really have to feel deeply because if it works, you live with the work that you've done for 30, 40 years and more. And um, and you really want to make it work, and that's that's what it's going to be. So as a follow-up question to that, I wonder if you could, I, I've wondered for a long time now about the, the subtitle of this book, The Tilt of History. And you don't actually explain it explicitly in the book itself. And I sense that the explanation you just gave gives us more insight into that. Because if, if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the myths about Kishinev tilt the history of that event and the history of everything around it in a certain direction and it's actually almost impossible to re to, to get things back to level as it were is that is that what you meant by that yeah i um i i i came across the word tilt i i, I we live in berkeley i teach at stanford and uh, not a, not um in, not infrequently there's there's traffic and um and i was listening to npr and someone used the word tilt and I thought, my God, that's what I'm writing about. I'm, I'm writing about, I'm not, I'm not writing about something that is the immediate aftermath. There are many factors that are there at work in any, shaping any, any moment in history. But I'm really talking about a tilt. And I, 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 I like the, 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 the phrase from Maimonides, I may vin yavin, um, he or she who, who understands, should, will understand. And so leaving things a little bit, um, not hitting the reader over the head, is, is something that I prefer to do as a writer. I'm good friends with my former Berkeley colleague, Yuri Sleskin, who writes very, very, very long books. I write shorter books. And as Yuri once said to me, he said, I, I, I model myself after Tolstoy, you model yourself after Chekhov. And, um, and, and that's, that's just you know, my, my own preference to, to do that and let the, let the reader's <laughs> mind work along with me. And um, I think also, you know, growing up in a milieu that tended to have all the answers and tended to Hector, my inclination is not to Hector, um, the, the reader. And so let the reader, in a sense, move along with me as I write. So, so tilt, tilt seemed the right word, and I decided not to explain it, just let it, let it sit and let, let it be as self-evident as possible. 
So actually, we're here today, according to the title of the of our event, to discuss the fifth chapter of the book, which some of you have read. If you're standing, um, if you want to sit, just feel free. I think you're, you're working here. Too. Yes, there, there are organizers. Uh, so the, 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 the fifth chapter is entitled Sages of Zion, Pavel Khrushchevan, and the Shadows of Kishinev. Now, Khrushchevan was the infamous publisher of Bissarabit, Kishinev's daily newspaper, which was also a viciously anti-Semitic rag uh, that whipped up anti-Jewish sentiment in the period leading up to the pogrom. And Khrushchevan also played a crucial role in the writing of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which we'll get to shortly. Now, one of the many, the many pleasures of the book uh, are the biographical sketches that you draw of a variety of historical actors. And one of the central such sketches is that of Khrushchevan. And the chapter focuses on the links, both ideological and personal links between Khrushchevan and various, various Jews, mostly Bessarabian Jews. Now, despite his fairly crucial role in fomenting one of the most insidious and influential conspiracy theories of all time, Khrushchevan remains pretty obscure. So can you tell us about him? Yeah, and it's not 100% clear. Khrushchevan is the first publisher of the protocols. And the first um, a version of the protocols, which isn't called the protocols, and the protocols aren't really protocols. And, the, and, and why it is that this particular anti-Semitic text ha continues to have legs in contrast to others, um, Chamberlain, the foundations of the 19th century, even Mein Kampf um, really is not widely quoted. Uh, the, the, the protocols tend to be uh, the province largely of the far right, but have, also have some purchase on the left. And, um, and so um, their impact is, is singularly promiscuous. And it's probably now the, the best known anti-Semitic text. Um, so the, 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 the origins are immensely complicated. I'm not going to go into it now. I'll, go, I'll talk about the, the connection between the Kishnev pogrom and, and, and the protocols. So um, it's Bessarabia, and especially the region that Kishinev is located in, at the far um, south um, uh, western corner of, of what was then the Russian Empire, now Moldova, um, was a, a center of far right political activity. And, and Khrushchevan was, at his t in his time, among the most prominent of all figures on the far right. And, um, and it, it, there's evidence, there's preponderance of evidence that the first version of the protocols actually emerged out of this region. We know that it was first published by Khrushchevan. There are differences between the Ukrainian usage and the Russian usage of various terms. The term for a Gentile, which is, which is uh, rather pre prevalently used in the protocols, um, in Ukrainian is Goryevsky, in Russian is Goysky, um, and, um, and um, all the Ukrainianisms like this are expunged after the first edition. So there's enough fingerprints to indicate that the first authors um, were from this region um, that, that tended to use Ukrainianisms rather than, than, than Russian terms. There's all sorts of other evidence as well. And of course, Khrushchevan ends up publishing it first. It seems the, the work was started to be produced by people around Khrushchevan before the Kishinev pogrom. But then Kishinev happens. Kishinev is located at the southwestern edge of the Russian Empire, and um, and um, the it, it, uh, it butts the Romanian border. And the R Romania at the time was the easiest place in the Russian Empire to to bribe people to send things across the border. It's the most bribable border in Russia, which is saying something, because almost every border in border in Russia <laughs> is bribable. But among the bribable borders, it's the best. And um, and so in some in some perhaps for that this reason, but it, for whatever reason, the correspondence bureau of the Zionist movement is actually located in Kishinev, and it's headed by this man Yakov Bernstein Kogan, and um, who who has all these runners running through the Romanian border to um, to um, um, send news about the Zionist movement. So when the Kishinev pogrom happens, the 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 news about it ends up being sent out incredibly fast because um, there's already this network um, to, send, to, send, to send out information. Um, it's at the very same time that, um, that Hearst 
he is starting to, um, his, his publishing um, um, uh, empire is beginning to be built. And, and th th think about whether this, this, you can think of any comparison. Um, Hearst is immensely ambitious. He's hoping to uh, perhaps run as the next Democratic candidate uh, for president. Um, he's already in Congress. And, um, and, he, and, and he's situated in New York where there's, sudden, where, where there's a huge body of politicized Jews. And so Kishnev is a way to energize these voters to love, to love, um, to love Hearst. And, um, and it's hard to actually get Jews not to vote Republican at the time and to vote Democrat for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which because of Southern segregationists. And so you have Hearst actually spreading the news about the Kishnev pogrom. The Kishnev pogrom suddenly um, um, explodes into, um, in, into the public view. Um, there's even discussion about America declaring war on Russia because of the Kishinev pogrom. It, it substantiates for people like Khrushchev the notion that Jews control the world, That's that, that Jews are actually in control of media, in control of, 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 of everything. And, um, and, and it turns out that the, um, and at the, at this, at the very moment where despite the preponderance of Jews in Russian radicalism, what is immensely preoccupying the Russian right and we can see this from the various periodicals, the Zionism, um, and no, in no small measure because Herzl. Herzl is claiming that he's going to be able to buy Palestine. Now, he barely has the money to, 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 to travel on trains, um, uh, but, but, but anti-Semites take Herzl at his word. And, um, and, and, and there are all these articles in the Russian, far-right Russian press. There, there's, there's a difference when one sees this Lahavdil with regard to Israel today, there's a right and there's a far right. And uh, we're talking here about the far right. There's a term in late Imperial Russia called a, an, a, a respectable anti-Semite. So these are unrespectable anti-Semites who, who actually take Herzl at his word and, um, and, um, and assume that once Jews buy Palestine, they're going to have the money to buy the world. And so there's, there's, there's suddenly the news about the, the Kishnev pogrom. There's suddenly talk about America declaring war on, 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 on Russia. Um, there's talk about utterly unrestricted immigration to uh, Jewish immigration to, to, from, from Russia to the United States. And this surfaces in no small measure because of a letter attributed to the Minister of Interior Pleve. And the letter that surfaces in the spring, very, a few weeks after the pogrom, basically is a letter to the Governor General of Bessarabia saying, hands off, let the pogrom happen. In other words, the Russian government, according to this letter, is actually fermenting violence on its own streets um, and, and, and fermenting the rape and the killing of Jews. It turns out the letter is a forgery. And, uh, but the letter, and it's probably forged by either a well-meaning uh, non-Jewish radical or a Jewish radical um, who assumes that if Pleva was tied to a chair the way in which someone might be in homeland, this is what Pleva would say. And uh, but Pleva doesn't say it. And, and the fact is, and you can challenge me on this score later, one of the greatest fears that the Russian government has is of pogroms. The Russian government does not ferment pogroms, despite what Jews and others tend to believe. You won't believe me. No one believes this. It's one of the great notions of, of, of um, the, the, what the Russian government fears most of all is anarchy in its countryside and its, and, and its streets. And the Russian regime, the Romanov regime is brought down in February 1917 by an urban riot. It has reasons to believe this. And so um, there's the widespread belief until the fall of the regime, which helps the regime in terms of its stability, that the Russian government is far more powerful than it is. And that actually helps sustain it. And Jews continue to believe that to this, to this day. And um, it's, it's blatantly anti-Semitic, but you could be blatantly anti-Semitic and not ferment riots on your own streets. So having said that, so it's so all this convergence of all kinds of things, the worldwide attention to the Kishnev pogrom, the, um, the, unre, uh, the announcement of basically unrestricted Jewish immigration to the United States, Herzl buying up Palestine and perhaps buying up, buying up the world. And all this, all, and the way in which um, Kishnev ends up being the epicenter of, of, this, of this plot because of the way in which news about the Kishnev pogrom spreads with alacrity within a, within a day or two. Had the same pogrom happened 200 miles to the east, it would not have actually gained anything close to no, no, notoriety. So the convergence of all this persuades people like Khrushchev that actually it's happening, that the Jews are beginning to take over the world 
and the, and the protocols are rushed to completion, the first version. And when he publishes them eventually, he admits that, the, that in, in a foreword to, um, in the Russian edition, in the initial edition, that it's rushed to, to publication. And he doesn't say it's because the Krishna program, but it's published just a few months, a couple months after the Krishna program erupts. And so I just summarized for you about 25 pages of the book. Um, hopefully it was done with sufficient clarity. And so you know, part of what, um, part of what oh, has always fascinated me as an historian is to be able to understand the inexplicable, to understand the, working, the workings of a mind that are vastly different from your own, to try to actually understand it and to understand it with sufficient empathy, um, not with sympathy, but with sufficient empathy to be able to capture it. And that's what I tried to do in this show. Is that a long answer to that? That's, that's a great answer. Yeah. And that is exactly the kind, I would say, the kind of empathy that, uh, that two of us, and I, I think, I hope most historians try to inculcate in our students to, to say, OK, you need to understand this historical actor well enough to understand why it is, what are their motivations? Why are they doing what they're doing? And, uh, and that's, that's what you do here. So I deeply believe in context which is um, um, a, a notion under some degree of embattlement these days. And um, to actually understand what it is that people with whom we disagree think, to understand the workings of their minds, um, to understand that they're not necessarily fools, even though we disagree with them. Now, Kujavan is, is a rabid anti-Semite who ferments pogroms. And so, so they're, to, to, to engaging in empathy with him is something of a task. But it's, it's a crucial task, it seems to me, certainly a crucial task uh, in order to, in, in part of the repertoire of what it means to be a credible historian. And I think actually you, you accomplish this in large measure in the book because you enable us to see more of the complexity of Khrushchev's life. And that you do in, in, I think, in large measure thanks to a cache of his personal papers um, that in an archival coup that any historian would be jealous of, you managed to secure just before finishing work or sometime before finishing work on the book. And these writings of his shed light on some very intriguing familial links with Jews and on his inner life. So maybe you could say more about these papers. Yeah, so I've been, uh, a lot of the work that I've done in the last, actually, last three books, including this, biography I'm now finishing on by Philip Roth, who benefits from papers that um, um, were un unknown to be in existence. And so I'm, I'm just about to finish this book, and, and books take a long time. And, um, and I'm about to leave for Moldova for, um, for Kish Chisinau, as it's now called, just for a final trip. And um, I I'm told by, there, there are few of us, a cluster of us around the world who are experts on the first version of the protocols. I'm told by this good German uh, friend of mine um, um, that there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a Jew from Kishnau who lives just down the street from Fenway, which in our family, given our, our Boston connections, is, 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 is the third temple and, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the only, only one that will ever be built, one, one hopes. And um, so uh, just down the street from Fenway and who has stuff connected with the protocols. And so I come to see him. And he's a former journalist who left Kishnau um, uh, along with the bulk of the, the Jewish community there in the 1990s. And at one point, he was writing an article about a sanitarium at the edge of, of Kishnau. And um, it was actually right around the time that the Soviet Union dissolved. And when the Soviet Union dissolved, well, what belonged, there were no such things as belongings any longer. And um, I, I had friends who were head of various consumal clubs in Moscow who held the keys to buildings in central Moscow who became instant multi multimillionaires because they held the keys. And once the Communist Party dissolved, no one owned them. And so they then leased them for 99 years and their lives were transformed and they, they now have yachts and perhaps are now corrupt. But the, um, the um, uh, uh, so this, this man, <laughs> utterly uncorrupt, uh, I'm sitting with him and he, um, so he, he had actually, um, in the wake of writing this article, 
about the sanitarium, he discovered that the nephew of, of Khrushchevan was in the sanitarium, was an inmate. And um, it seems when the nephew died, I don't know exactly the, the background, he didn't ask too many questions about Providence, um, the, um, he actually was given the, the, um, the nephew's papers, which included, turns out, the most sensitive of all papers of Khrushchevans. And I'm sitting in his living room and he puts the papers on my lap and I realize that I'm reading Khrushchevans' uh, diary from the time he's 16 in Russian. And, um, and there's all sorts of other material that I end up uh, integrating into the book. And then he turns to me and he says, well, why don't you take it? <laughs> and um, I was leaving the next morning for Moldova and I walked into a FedEx place and I asked, how much insurance do you, do you um, how much insurance should I get for the papers of the first, um, uh, for the author of the protocols of the LSSI and it's apparently you insure them for 50,000. Um, you know, I mean, if that's the insurance amount, you don't pay it. And um, so uh, I, I then, uh, and then eventually I arranged for, for sale to the Hoover Institution uh, next door to my office in Stanford. But um, so included, so these, it, it turns out, it seems all but certain, perhaps certain, um, we, we used like, we, people like that time, we used terms like all but certain, um, probably too often, to, um, these were the most sensitive of all Khrushchevan's papers, which is why he gave them to the nephew. Um, Khrushchevan today is an emblem in this region of extreme anti-Semitism, anti-feminism, hom homophobia. It turns out Khrushchevan was, was a closeted um, homosexual. Um, the diary um, describes in, in, in rather vividly his love for a Cossack of the, of the male persuasion. Um, um, and um, and his, his nephew, who had every reason to tell the truth, he, he, he adored his uncle, describes, we, we, know, we, we knew, I knew, it was well known that Khrushchevan's mother dies when he's very, very young. He, he yearns for her his, his entire life. His father remarries. He's not close to his stepmother. According to the nephew, his stepmother is a Jew. And the, 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 the author of the protocol, Zelda Zion, has a mother who's a Jew. And um, uh, you just, just can't trust these people. And uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Isaiah Berlin once described anti Semitism as hating Jews more than, more than is necessary. And uh, uh, let, let's sequester that for the moment. And um, so, and all sorts of other amazing details. One detail that turns to be accurate because actually it ended up being covered in the Yiddish foreword is that his, his sister or stepsister, um, falls in love with a Jew. She runs away to Baltimore. He's a shamus of a shul. There's a picture of her in, in a shaitel uh, for the 1930s. I mean, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't make this stuff up. And, um, and so uh, suddenly I, I, I have this and I have to rewrite the entire chapter of the book um, and my portrait of Khrushchevan. And so this leavens considerably the, the chapter that, I, that, that I'm speaking about here today. Okay, I want to go back to the. <laughs> my, my, I, I mentioned this the other day when I gave a talk about Philip Roth. My, uh, so my, my father was a CPA and had five graduate degrees, including a doctorate. And that, I picked up a law degree, picked up one at USC. And we had a building in the back of our house in LA with 30,000 books. And, um, and so I, uh, I, I was able to read anything but while preparing, while being prepared to be an observant Jew. But my father's favorite books. Which he, which he had right beside the, the, the chair where he would sleep on Shabbos afternoon were books entitled in one way or another, Stranger Than Fiction. And, um, and, and, and that's what I've, I'm constantly finding. Certainly I'm, I'm finding that as I write about Philip Roth and um, about life that's stranger than fiction or that life is, is very comparable to fiction. And, um, and, and that, that's very much what I, I discovered in writing this um, as, as this book just evolved and became what it became. Yeah, it's it's startling, really, um, and certainly helps me understand that world and the world that gave rise to the protocols. Um, now, those of us who have had the misfortune of reading the protocols know that it is a very tiresome read. It's long winded. It's rambling. It's quite repetitive. Um, and I often explain its popularity to my students in terms of its ability to offer an easy explanation for the very complex challenges of modernity. Um, how would you explain its resilience? Yeah, so it's, um, it's an awful read, but it's also an intriguing read. And, that's, and I argued this uh, in an article I wrote for The Atlantic a year or two ago. So um, the, the, 
at least 70% of the text of the protocol, depending on, and it goes through various editions and, and there's changes in these various editions. And there's, there's, there's no reason for any of you to read all of them. Um, um, 70% is actually copied from a book by an anti Napoleon III book by a, a very sophisticated political theorist named Maurice Jolie, who who's, uh, has a very unfortunate life and ends up committing suicide. The book ends up being obscure, and it serves as the kind of ur text for the people who actually write the protocols. So one of the aspects, one of the um, 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 uh, impressive, if you will, aspects of the protocols is that in, in, in embedded in it is Jolie's argument about the about the possibility of totalitarianism. Uh, the, the protocols have have nothing of classical anti and anti Judaism. There's no talk of ritual murder. There's no talk of religion. It's an entirely secular volume, which is one of the reasons it has the kind of promiscuous impact that it has. You don't have to be a right winger to like the protocols, but what but embedded in it is part of Jolie's very sophisticated argument, which he's leveling against Napoleon III, about the possibilities of, of someone being elected to power and then, and then turning it into a totalitarian state. And so there's something very sophisticated embedded in the protocols. And I think that's one of the reasons why actually it has, it continues to have legs. But I, perhaps the most, most important reason is it is akin, it, it, explanation of its power is um, it has the power, if you will, of talk radio or talk news. Um, think of um, the late the lamented of Tucker Carlson and um, um, soon to return, I suspect. Um, <laughs> everything good in our culture returns. And um, so um, it's, it's, um, it's, not a, it's not a third, um, it, it's a text, it's a text that actually proves in and of, in the text, what it's actually declaring it's the at the core of the protocols is the voice of the elder it's not clear from the protocols where he's talking um it's not clear exactly who he is um but its power is contained in in its voice and um and um he is admitting for reasons that are completely unclear the the intent of jews to take over the world and um, and so it's not a secondhand or thirdhand text describing what it is. He's describing actually what is happening and that he and what he knows is happening. And so I think typologically, for reasons not dissimilar from the power of talk radio or talk television, uh, which has now even taken over CNN. If you look there, they're acting like they're having conversations and chatting and stuff um, uh, because presumably no one will listen to the news otherwise. Um, 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 it, it has it, it, it has it contains some of that power. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it has sustained power. It's political promiscuity. It's um, the fact that it actually offers a incisive portrait of totalitarianism and the fact that actually it has the same power as, as talk radio or, or, or the, the kind of talk that, that now that hectors us on channels that we might fall into it mistakenly. And um, so I, I, I would begin answering it there. And, um, and then, um, I mean, it, it really comes to the surface. It, this first edition is 1903, but it really um, gains notice, enormous notice in the wake of the Russian Revolution. And, um, and its repetitiveness is actually to its benefit because you don't have to read more than one page to get what it's saying. And, um, and, and it, consequently, it has an impact on semi-literate or illiterate soldiers who are fighting the Bolsheviks because they, you have pages read to them. We did the Hoover Institution um, um, on my campus we have hundreds of thousands of torn pages of the protocols that were torn out of the edition and just read to um, anti-Bolshevik soldiers and in order to inspire them to, to fight against this Jewish controlled Bolshevik regime, in quotes. And, um, and so that's another benefit. In other words, in some ways, its, its shortcomings are actually its benefits. The remarkable story. Okay, I think this is a good moment to uh, to open our conversation up to. Just add one more thing. Sure, I, go ahead. The, what I learned in, in writing this book, and in, and in just piecing together the Krishna program, is that, um, and I learned this in part because 
as violent as the pogrom was, and there were about 900 pogromists who attacked Jews in a city of 100,000, a city with about 35% um, of the population Jewish, um, is that it was not by any means uncommon for Jews um, to run into the homes of Gentile friends or acquaintances and be saved. So this is not simply a story of an entire town turning against Jews. And what I think I've come to learn, and this has some relevance to um, um, hatred fermented today, uh, um, um, is that attitudes toward Jews, even in a setting which, were, which is overwhelmingly anti-Semitic, which, which is true of late Imperial Russia, attitudes toward Jews are made out of a whole um, medley of incohate assumptions that could be um, seen as admirable or, 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 or heinous. Uh, Jews are believed to be good with money, even though the vast majority of Russian Jews are utterly impoverished. Um, that could be seen as an admirable trait or terrible trait. Jews um, were considered to be, have the, the mysterious capacity not to, be, um, um, not to be drawn into alcoholism. That could be seen as an admirable trait or the, the product of a kind of mysterious magic. Um, the, it, it requires really leadership, ideological leadership, political leadership, to turn the incohate into something focused. And I, I think that became clear to me as I was writing this book. And then a, as I was finishing the book and had finished the book and watched um, um, uh, Donald Trump at, at rallies um, make um, tens and hundreds of thousands of people hate the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, really, what do people in these rallies know about the Chinese Communist Party? Mm -hmm. But he tells them that they're to be hated, and they're hated. And, um, and so there's something, there's this thing called COVID may come from China, and so consequently it's infected the world. There's, there's Fauci, who's, who's horrible. And so you actually, you don't care much about this before you attend the rally. But suddenly you're told this by a figure of, of great authority, and you, and you hate. And there's something typologically similar with regard to anti-Semitism. It really requires someone, some force, to organize otherwise um, a medley of assumptions that turn you, make you hate Jews, hate people of color, hate suddenly, suddenly hate the transgendered people who are taking over the world, um, who are writing the textbooks that are corrupting our children. Um, it, 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 that's required, and I think there you find a, a similarity between um, anti-Jewish hatred and a whole medley of other hatreds. That, that are continue to infect our lives today. Yeah, thanks for adding that too, especially because I, I, it did put me in mind, especially the uh, later chapters in the book of other conspiracy theories, including that, uh, that what you just mentioned, this current wave of kind of mania against trans people uh, and the LGBTQ community as if they're somehow uh, orchestrating the manipulate you know the manip manipulation of uh, American minds, especially young minds, and um, and so on and so forth. It, it takes a bizarre cultural moment to actually ha hate Judy Bloom. <laughs> you know, you know, you, you you you. I mean, that that takes immense creativity. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. 